Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51% to show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, acknowledging women's role in French history with two female resistance fighters being interred at the Pantheon Mausoleum here in Paris. Also, a downing report accuses the Egyptian government of sanctioning sexualised torture. And a Turkish feminist drama attracts rave reviews at the Cannes Film Festival. But we begin here in France where two heroines of the French resistance during the Second World War have been admitted to the Pantheon. The Paris Mausoleum is the final resting place of the country's national heroes. But so far, out of the 75 people interred, only four are women, with the government keen to readdress the balance, as Lucy Proven reports. For decades, the message has been clear. It's even written on the front of the building. To its great men, a grateful nation. But that is changing. President Francois Hollande has inducted two women into the Pantheon. There's already one woman on it here, Nobel Prize winner Marie Curie. She's joined only by Sophie Berthelot, who's buried here more for her role as a wife than as a hero. Hollande will bring the total to four women and 73 men. These four great French women and French men embody the spirit of resistance. They gave their flesh and soul to the Republic. Today's Republic, the fifth in French history, was founded by World War II resistance hero General de Gaulle. His niece, jean viev de Gaulle Antonio's, alongside Germain Tillon, are now being honoured by Hollande for their role in the resistance, a fight history traditionally says was won by men. They're being placed centre stage in a seminal moment in French memory, not just as wives and companions, but leaders. Women didn't have the simple role we attributed to them for such a long time, just to transmit hidden message. Germaine Tillon is an excellent example. She was the co-founder of a resistance network. Women were leaders. They were heavily involved. The two women were leaders in post-war France too. jean viers campaigning resulted in a new law against great poverty in France. Germaine was a vocal critic of France's use of torture in Algeria. The two remain friends throughout their lives, and for them to be honoured together is certainly important, but its impact is negotiable. Surveys show many young people in France are not even sure what the Pantheon is. It's a very important step towards progress, but it is still insufficient. What we need now is that these women appear in history books and school curriculums, where they're still invisible, even today. As the symbolic coffins of jean viev and Germain are carried into the Pantheon, outside, the hope that many more women will join them. And that story by Lucy Proven. According to a report published by the International Federation of Human Rights, state-sanctioned sexual violence against Egyptian women has risen dramatically since the military returned to power in July 2013. The report reveals a vast array of sexualised torture carried out by Egyptian police, military and state security forces. It ranges from anything from sexual harassment through to rape and genital electrocution. With me in the studio today is the Federation's Director of Women's Rights, uh, Catherine Booth. Uh, Catherine, thanks for being with us. Uh, now, because of the taboos surrounding sex in the region and its very powerful association with shame, Sexual violence is very much a formidable tool of violence, isn't it? That's absolutely right. Uh, it's extremely difficult for victims of sexual violence to make complaints. Um, there are obstacles at every step. Uh, there are, first of all, the, the social obstacles, the stigmatisation, perhaps there's rejection. there's a lot of shame. Associate. Linked to the shame, uh, of course, the the question of virginity uh, is of extreme importance. Uh, so anyone who complains of rape uh, is openly saying that they're no longer a virgin with all the consequences that that may have for their own lives and for their family life. Um, and then uh, in police stations, uh, these complaints are often not taken seriously. People are discouraged from uh, lodging complaints. Uh, sometimes we've seen lawyers uh, discourage complainants from pursuing complaints because they're worried themselves for their clients about the, the reprisals they might suffer. 
um, and we see very few complaints reaching the stage of prosecution uh, and conviction of the perpetrators. But when it comes to Egypt, it seems like sexual harassment and sexual violence is a real problem there, even more so than its neighbours. I think, unfortunately, that's true. We've called it in the past an epidemic um, that affects uh, Egypt and, and, and Egyptian women in particular. It, it cannot simply be explained by uh, structural discrimination, cultural issues. Uh, it, it's certainly a, a different scenario in Egypt from the other countries in the region. The violence that FIDH has revealed in this report, committed by state actors, committed by those very actors who are supposed to be protecting the population, protecting women, may go some way to explain why it's so endemic in Egyptian society. But why has it become so bad under this regime? What we've seen under this regime, so is a change in tendency, a change in pattern. Uh, we uh, saw uh, under the previous regime, the Morsi regime, uh, many uh, acts of sexual assault, sexual harassment and rape against women in the public sphere, in particular women protesters in Tahrir Square and around. Um, committed by, the uh, the perpetrators were never formally identified, uh, uh, there have been uh, extremely few prosecutions, um, but it seems that they were committed by groups of thugs, civilians. Uh, what we've seen since the military resumed power uh, is uh, a surge in the number of uh, complaints, the number of cases documented of um, the authorities themselves perpetrating sexual violence against women. And it's not just women who are being targeted. Absolutely. It's important to, to say that it's not just women who, who are being targeted. It appears from the evidence that we've put together that it's a tool of repression being used to stifle civil society, uh, being used against uh, political opponents, uh, activists, but not only. Um, it's being used against women generally, um, against students, uh, and a particular campaign that we've seen launched since October 2013 targeting uh, LGBT people, uh, sexual minorities. And what can be done about it, and particularly is there anything the international community can do about it, given that it is a very conservative society? Um, well, the, the prime responsibility is on the shoulders of the Egyptian state uh, and given that these are uh, actors who are under the direct control and responsibility of the state uh, with police, military, national security, intelligence, um, they should begin by condemning all such acts, uh, toleration of these acts and um, call for um, investigations and prosecutions how, into every allegation. But how is that possible, given that they're the ones who are actually perpetrating this violence towards women? Well, that's what's extremely difficult. Um, but that's why you need a, a very strong political will um, to indicate that these acts are not tolerated. Um, and you need proper uh, judicial investigations uh, into uh, every allegation. And can the international community do anything as a result? Well, the, com the international community, um, which uh, uh, has many interests in, in Egypt and, and, and is pursuing uh, uh, negotiations and collaboration with the Egyptian state on many levels, uh, must call for this particular issue to be taken extremely seriously, must call for results, uh, must call for the Egyptian state to go beyond the piecemeal and inadequate measures that it's taken so far uh, with a little law reform here, a couple of prosecutions there, uh, the creation of a unit within the Ministry of Interior um, to deal with these crimes. Uh, the international community uh, must be calling for results, and that is to say those who commit such crimes uh, must be brought to justice uh, and the victims must be given reparation. Catherine Booth, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you. And finally, one movie that created waves at the recent Cannes Film Festival was the Turkish feminist drama Mustang. It's set in a remote village and follows the flowering sexuality of five sisters and the outraged reaction of conservative villagers and family members. Aurore Dupuy has more. <laughs> 
Eğer beni ondan başka biriyle evlendirmeye kalkarsan tığlığı basarım. Ne diyorsun sen? Mustang, or the story of five cheeky sisters aged 12 to 16, they rebel against a conservative society where men rule women. They're raised by their grandmother in a remote village of Turkey. One day, an innocent game with boys turns into a scandal. <laughs> The film is based on true stories, but the dialogues are pure fiction. That scene is something I've experienced myself. But when it happened to us, we looked down, we were mortified. We were accused of doing something disgusting because our crotch touched the boys' necks. Whereas in the film, one of the girls destroys the kitchen chairs, saying, these chairs touched our asses. Why isn't that gross? With her film, the Franco-Turk director wants to fight for women's rights in Turkey. I can't say that 35 million women have the same destiny as my characters, but there are honor killings and forced marriages. At the same time, there are some totally free women in Turkey. It's a paradox. A message of hope, bravery and perseverance the five sisters represent a rebellious youth, free-spirited, like Mustang horses. And that's it for now. And if you'd like to comment on what you've just seen, you can head to our Facebook page. That's France 24, full stop, 51%, or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. And thanks for your feedback so far. And please keep those comments coming in. Until our next program, bye for now.